The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Hello, welcome to our second, I think, biology seminar of the semester. I'm Dr. Grove. For those of you that don't know me, I'm here in the biology department. And we are here to welcome and listen to Corey Smith who is here from BioLink Scientific. It's a biotech company, well, a lab supply company. She'll tell us more about it, uh, based in Wimberley. She, uh, Corey Smith graduated from Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas, and she earned her Bachelor of Science in Biology with an emphasis in microbiology and a minor in chemistry when she was there. Uh, upon graduation, she worked as a quality control microbiologist for Sulzer Carbomedics, and then she was an account manager for a company called On Assignment, and she's going to tell us a little bit about that as well today. And she was a sales manager for United Laboratories, which is a lab supply company, and then after Katrina, that company, the territory she covered, was sort of decimated by Katrina, and uh, she no longer was able to work with them because she'd lost all of her clients and ended up opening a company. So something golden came out of kind of lemonade out of lemons, I suppose <laughs> we could think of it as. So uh, she is here to tell you about uh, careers on the other, other side, additional careers in biology. And I'm going to clip her up so that we can get a good recording. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grove. As you already know, my name is Corey Smith. I'm the president and CEO of BioLink Scientific. BioLink is a laboratory supply company that services the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, medical device, and research industries. I'm so excited to be here today with Texas Lutheran University to share some of my experience as a scientist and also talk to you about some career opportunities that may be available for you. I remember I graduated from ASU in the December month of 1996 as a biologist. And to celebrate my accomplishments, my family threw a big party, big dinner party. And I remember during that dinner party, my brother came up to me and said, so Corey, why in the world do you do with a science degree? <laughs> and I looked at him right in the eyes, and I rolled my eyes, and I said, I'm going to do great things with my science degree. And I turned around, and I walked down the hall to the other room, and I closed the door, and I took a big deep breath, and I went, what am I going to do with my science degree? But I'm here to tell you now. Fifteen years later, there are ample opportunities for us scientists in the world. You can teach in the academic field, like Dr. Groves and Dr. Jonas. You can go into research, such as cancer research. Or the environmental Texas Parks and Wildlife has a great forensics lab just outside of, of San Marcos. They have a team of scientists working for them. The medical industry, of course, you can be a doctor, a surgeon, a clinical practitioner. And industry and sales, which is where my experience lies. So what exactly is industry? What's industrial science? It encompasses careers in the research and manufacturing of products and services such as polymers and coatings, pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, medical devices, food, environmental, chemicals, cosmetics, biotechnology, and even the government offices that are in charge of regulating these industries such as the Federal Drug Administration, or USDA. Now, what does industrial science really look like in real life? These pictures represent a product that a few of my clients manufacture. 
Let's take, for example, this heart valve. This is a biological or a mechanical heart valve that was manufactured by a company called Sulzer Carbometics in Austin, Texas, where I was a microbiologist. This is makeup, the makeup I have on today. It's manufactured by a company right here in Central Texas that manufactures organic makeup. This horse is actually a product from one of my clients that clones high-valued livestock, such as race horses. Of course, we all know what Dr. Pepper is. Look at Mr. Ben or Dr. Ben Tanner, this guy staring through the petri dish up there. He's a client of mine, really funny guy. He actually moved from California to Texas about two years ago. And he opened up a laboratory or a company that staffs five microbiologists and a lot of technologists. And he analyzes chemicals or cleaners from chemical manufacturers such as Clorox. You have other companies here in Texas that food science helped develop cakes and baking mixes. But let's look at this little interesting character. Do you guys recognize him? Yeah. Well, I lovingly call him the boogeyman. But we're going to talk to him about him a little later on in this presentation. But I want you to remember him. Now, let's take a glimpse inside one of these industrial corporations. And since my experience as a microbiologist came from the medical device industry, I'm going to use a medical device company as my example. I'm going to talk to you about the departments, the government agencies, and also the skills needed to work in one of these corporations. Let's start with departments. R&D, research and development. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's the research and development of new products with inside a company that are going to go to market to sell to you. Validation or material testing. It's a department with a group of people that work in there that validate or inspect all the incoming materials used to make that product and all the equipment that's used to make the product. Quality control. That's where I worked. I was one of five staff quality control microbiologists inside this medical device company. And it was my job to ensure that the heart valves that we manufactured were safe to put inside someone's heart. So what did we do in quality control? Well, we tested and monitored everything that came in contact with that heart valve. We tested the room that it was being made in, called the clean room. Clean room is a room for a sterile environment. We tested the air inside that clean room because it was touching our product. We tested the water that we used to wash the product. We tested the people that handled the product. And of course, we tested the product itself before the company was able to sell it to any surgeon for implant, it had to pass our inspection. So sometimes we were not always the most popular people in the company. So in order to do our job, we had a set of regulations, a set of rules that we used to test this product and the, and the environment around it. And those regulations were written by the company itself, such as Standard Operating Procedures, or SOPs. Also, good current good manufacturing practices and current good laboratory practices. 
And since we sold our heart valve internationally, we were ISO certified, which means we were, had a certification that we met a certain type of quality, international standard operations. So if the company itself developed all these standard operating procedures to help us do our jobs, who governed quality control? Who regulated us? Well, that's where these guys come in, quality assurance. As quality control microbiologists, we were mandated to document every single test that we performed within that laboratory. And we had to document it with precise detail. And we filed those documents after each test. Well, the Department of Quality Assurance would come into our, our laboratory periodically and pull that documentation and review it. They would conduct an audit on quality control to make sure we were following those strict guidelines. So this was all internal monitoring within this corporation. So who governed the corporation? The government. The government has agencies such as the FDA that made sure that we were selling a product that was safe for you. So they would send a team of agents to come in whenever they liked, unexpectedly. We never knew when our FDA agents were going to come in and audit us. And they had access to every department within that company. And they could just walk into our lab at any given moment with their nice suits on and pull our documentation. If they found that we were not doing our job and we were not creating a product that was safe for you, they could shut our doors. And guess what? We can't sell any of our products. And guess what? We don't do business. So these guys mean business. So what kind of skill set do you need to work in a company such as this or a government agency such as the FDA? Well, we hired microbiologists, we hired chemists, we hired engineers, and we hired sales representatives with backgrounds in the sciences and or businesses. So now that we've seen a glimpse inside this corporation, how do you even get a job inside one of these companies? Well, you start by building a network of professionals, a network of colleagues within your industry. I started my network when I was in college, and I'm still networking today. I've met a lot of your professors today, and they're going into my network. Your professors have a strong network of people themselves. Do you know how many students your professors have passed through their hands? I was talking to Dr. Jonas earlier. He's been here, Dr. Jonas, over 20 years. So there's been a lot of students go past him, and guess where those students are? They're now, some of them, are in these hiring positions at these corporations. So get to know your professors. They can help you out. You never know when they might catch wind of a job opportunity or an internship. Also, your career advisors, of course, but also the Internet. The internet is an amazing tool, and uh, especially with social media today, Facebook, Meetup.com, Google, LinkedIn. I am always amazed at my LinkedIn account. There's numerous opportunities I come to through the people that I have met and joined with on LinkedIn. But I want to be warn you. Your Facebook post, as an employer, guess what the first thing I do after I interview someone for a job? Whew, Facebook, 
because I only get the best of you in that interview. I want to know what you're really like. The internet tells me a lot about you. So, also driving around. Driving around, you wouldn't think would be so great, but I let me tell you, I started my sales career about 13 years ago. I went from a microbiologist into the sales, outside sales industry. I landed an amazing sales job at a company called On Assignment, the lab support division. And what we did was we interviewed scientists, much like you guys when you graduate college, and we find companies to place you to work inside. So it was my job to find the companies for you to work in. I got paid to find you a job. So some companies are very well known, like Coca-Cola. They have laboratories. Everybody knows about Coca-Cola. But there are hundreds and hundreds of companies out there that aren't so visible like Coca-Cola. So this is where this little, oh, pardon me, this little slime guy comes in, the little boogeyman that I talked about earlier. I have a story about him. Because I have a strong network of colleagues around me that I've built up over the years, I got a phone call from one of them one day. He said, hey, Corey, I just left this really cool pharmaceutical company. They have a large laboratory. I think you might benefit from talking to the lab manager there. So I called her up and I got an appointment. And the next day, I drove down that tree-lined street, in a nice little neighborhood, and I came across this tan building. No sign, just a tan building in a nice neighborhood. So my appointment and was set up and I walked in and guess who greeted me there? The boogeyman. He was all over their walls, all over their bookshelves, all over their products. They were the pharmaceutical that company that manufactured Mucinex, which, by the way, I think is an amazing product. My point being is it's not always easy to find these companies. They're not well advertised. They don't always have neon flashing signs to say, hey, come work here if you're a scientist. So a really, really great way to find those companies is to sign up with temporary staffing agencies such as Lab Support, Aerotech, K-Force, to name a few. If those sales representatives are doing their job effectively enough, they have access to those hiring managers inside those companies, and they can hand deliver your resume directly to those lab managers. Now, and those sales managers have techniques that they've learned. They've gone through some hardcore sales training to find out the secrets of finding these companies. One method they use to build their strong network is they go to professional society meetings. And there are tons of them here in Texas. If you're going into microbiology, the American Society of Microbiology is a great source. American Chemical Society, if you're a chemist. If you were going into the food industry, the International Food Technology Group is a great source. So whatever you decide to do, whether it's industry, professor, whatever, it's always a good idea to have a strong network built up with people in your industry because you never know when you might meet your next employer. So it's not as, it's just as important within industry to have a good network, but it's vital, vital for one profession. Sales. And notice there's a little word, outside sales because I'm not referring to the person behind the Banana Republic counter that's there to greet you when you go in to buy the clothes that you want. I'm talking about the person that's been hired by a corporation 
to sell a product to a client that may not know at the time that they want the product, nor know at the time that they need the product. And you have to convince that person that they need your product and they will buy your product. It's not always an easy task. So what skill sets are important for a good sales representative? Being a good problem solver, kind of think on your feet kind of person. Someone that can multitask because there's a lot of job responsibilities for a sales representative, such as quotes and appointment making and prospecting. Someone that has a high energy. I can't sit still, not for five minutes. So that profession's been really great for me because I'm always on the go and I'm always moving. Excellent time manager. Like I said, you have a lot of duties to juggle, so time, time management is crucial in this profession. Someone that can handle high pressure. I have a lot of pressure as a sales representative to sell the product and also to forward the company. You are front lines to that corporation to sell that product. It's your responsibility to grow the company. Someone that's self-motivating. Many sales reps have home offices and it's really nice. I can get up in my jammies and work for an hour and be just fine with that. But it's kind of hard it's easy to get into a rut that you'll stay inside for an extra three hours today. Guess what that does? It won't allow you to meet your quota. An inviting personality. It's a fact. People buy products from people they like and people they trust. And persistence. That's probably one of the most critical things about a sales rep. I always tell my sales staff, especially the ones that don't have experience, is when a client tells you no, it doesn't mean no, it means just not now. So you gotta get up and go back out there to that same client the next week and try to get them to buy from you. And I love Joey and Michael's quote. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable because in the life of a sales representative, you are always outside that comfort zone. You're always in a position like you're applying for a job every single day of your life. Something's new every single day. And it's not always a comfortable position to be in. So what are the pros of being a sales rep? Well, I happened as a scientist to love it. I fell into it by accident, but I fell in love with it and I don't see myself doing anything else. I get to be a problem solver. Somebody has an issue with a product in their lab and they can't conduct their test until the issue's resolved. Well, that's where I come in. Something new every day. I have been into research facilities, pharmaceutical companies, food manufacturers. I have seen it all. I've been in research facilities researching neurological regeneration, and I have been in dissecting laboratories in MD Anderson Cancer Center. So it's always something fun and new every single day. High energy, like I said, I can't sit still. So I like to be on the go at all times. Setting your own, own schedule. I have an own office. I have millions of clients. I pretty much get to go wherever I want to every day, as long as I'm getting my job done. And meeting new people. I will tell you, just 15 years of doing sales, I have met some amazing people. And those people have really become my colleagues and my family. And there are some really great people in the science industry. So if you look up here at this picture, 
this lady, the sales rep, she's very happy. She probably just sold something, landed a big contract. And here's probably her boss. He's really happy because she just grew the company some more. And there's the client. She's happy because she got her problem solved. Everybody's happy and warm and fuzzy. Now, most days are like this. Some are not. Some days are like this guy. When you get told nothing but no every single day, every single moment, and nothing seems to go right. So what are the cons about being an outside sales rep? High pressure. Like I said, you're front man on the, on the line. You've got to raise the company to grow, but also sell that product to that client that may not want it. You got to make your quota. The company's got to grow. Time management, you've got reports, you've got appointments, you've got prospecting. Something's going on all the time. And you've got to be able to prioritize and set that time management. Being told no. Ugh, that's a hard one. A lot of fresh graduates that go into sales, that's all they hear day in and day night. It's a grind because the client doesn't know you. They don't know who you are. Why should they buy anything from you? They don't have a relationship with you. So you hear this a lot. Not so much when you're a veteran and old like me. <laughs> you get to develop relationships and get to know people and it does get much easier. You've just got to be persistent and stay with it. High turnover. A lot of sales reps have the uh, threat of losing their job. That's true. But as long as you're efficient and proactive, you're not going to have anything to worry about because you've got the time management, the energy skills, you know what you have to do. So some days for a sales rep can feel a little bit like the roller coaster. Some days you'll be on the top and feeling great about yourself. The very next day, you're on the very bottom, not feeling so great about yourself. But just wait a day, because it'll all circle back around. You'll be right back on top the next day. So whether you're in sales or research or professor, we all are faced with the interview. Now you can have an interview, or you can have a great interview. What's the difference? Preparation. Dress professionally. I personally always wear a suit to my interviews. Always. Unless they specifically tell me, Corey, wear blue jeans and tennis shoes, I wear a suit. Not only do I look professional and I come across that way, but the more I look professional, the more confident I feel. And that really exudes out when you're in front of that person that's going to hire you. Please research the company before you go in that interview. Um, every company has a website. And on most websites, they have an About Me page. It tells you all about the company. Their taglines, what they sell, how long they've been in business. Write it all down because it's very impressive. Especially, I know, because I'm a hiring manager on most days, when an interviewer comes in to interview with me and they know all about me and my company. Shows that you're interested in that company and you really want to work there. Do a mock interview. Download some questions off of Google, your typical interview questions, and have your family and your friends interview you. That way you can rehearse them and Get comfortable with the answers. <clears throat> Drive to the location the night before. I always do this. You never know when there's a traffic jam or construction or something that's going to get in your way that's going to make you be late for an interview. I don't like people to be late for my interviews whatsoever. <sighs> Arrive no more than 10 minutes early for an interview. Now, I know we're all eager to get the job, and we want to get there on time, 
but please don't walk in 30, 40 minutes early for an interview. The reason being is those hiring managers are busy people too, and they have a set allotted amount of time to spend with you. If you come outside that time allotted for you, they're gonna have to stop what they're doing, refocus on you, and they may not be prepared themselves. So may, if you have to sit in your car for 30 minutes, do so, but I would not go in at least before 10 minutes. Strong handshake. Really, you've got about three minutes to make a good impression with somebody. And a strong handshake and well-dressed person is really going to excel with that. Take notes. Some people have the misconception that taking notes is rude during an interview, but it shows me that the person I'm interviewing is interested in what I have to say, and they want to learn what I have to say about me and my company. Ask questions. On that About Me page on the website of the company, you might find some questions to ask that company when you're in there interviewing with them. So it just shows, again, your interest within the corporation. And get a deadline. Hi, hiring manager. When do you expect to fill this position? Now, being after the interview is probably just as important, if not more important, than the interview itself. You need to be proactive in this time period because I guarantee you, you're not the only one interviewing for the job. So you wanna make yourself stand out from your other peers. How you do that, first of all, soon as you leave that appointment, write that deadline date, the date that they're expected to hire someone down on your calendar. The next, send an email. Most of us have smartphones now and we can send an email from our car. Do it immediately. What that does is it gets your name in front of that hiring manager again. Oh yeah, I remember you. Send an old fashioned thank you note in the mail as soon as you get home. What that's gonna do is when you mail it, it's gonna arrive there the next day or the day after, and it's gonna get your name in front of that hiring manager yet one more time. Oh yeah, that was Corey, I, I liked Corey. She's pretty awesome, pretty awesome gal there. Then finally that deadline approaches. Oh my gosh, it's the deadline, they've made their decision, but I haven't heard, so I guess I didn't get the job. Bad mistake. Especially if you're a sales representative. Pick up the phone and call them. Hi, hiring manager. I interviewed with you last Wednesday. I was really interested and excited about the job. Have you hired anyone yet? That shows you're really eager, you're really motivated. And especially for a sales representative, that's going to show that hiring manager that you're not afraid to ask for the job. And I actually do something as an employer when I hire a sales rep, if I don't hear back from that person, if I don't get that deadline date phone call, I won't talk to them. I will not hire that person. It's a test. And a lot of companies do that test on their sales representative. So if you are proactive and you get out of your comfort zone and out of the box, chances are you're going to be welcomed into your new job. Now whether you're teaching or going into research, going into industrial science, or into sales, I wish you the best of luck. And I know that you'll excel at as scientists, and I look forward to having you in my network of colleagues. Thank you very much for your time.
now if you guys have any questions, just raise your hand, shout them out, and if you can remember to repeat the question for the recording. Sure. That would be great. Well, somebody has to have a question. Otherwise, I'm going to feel like I've bored you to death. So. Absolutely. Building that relationship, not just in sales, but in any industry. You're building those network of colleagues to follow you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, your company, do they offer any internships right now? Or? You know what? We're a small company. We've only been open five years, which is a benchmark for us. Most companies fail within the first three years, so we're celebrating this year. So at this point, we're not. But I do t tell people that if you have questions or you want advice or maybe even tag along with me for the day, give me a call and I'll be sure to help you as much as I can. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little bit about on assignment? Because I, that's a, it's kind of a temp agency of sorts, right? Yes. Um, if you're an applicant, do you have to pay to work with them, or how does that work? I am so glad you asked that question. The question was, do you have to pay a temporary staffing agency to sign up with them? And the answer is no. Oh. How all that works is, is like, for example, on assignment, the lab support division. It was our jobs. How we made money was we marked your salary up another couple of dollars per hour. And then we got the markup as payment for finding you. A lot of companies don't have the resources, especially startup companies, to have HR managers. And I even find this in my company, is I find it hard to find a pool of qualified candidates. So we hire temporary staffing agencies to do all that footwork with us. It saves us a tremendous expense. The most expensive thing in a company is hiring someone. And so what those sales representatives do, they're trained to look for companies to hire you. And like I said, not all of them are highly visible. There are secrets like driving around looking for smokestacks on the buildings. <laughs> that tells us, hmm, there might be a lab in there. So we do a little research and we call the, the client and we get in and talk to the hiring managers that way. So we're paid by the hour, just like you are as a temporary employee, and, but we don't get any part of your salary and you don't pay us anything. Um, so, but I will tell you, such as lab support, about 90% of the temp jobs that we place scientists in went permanent. So it's a, usually a contract with the staffing firm to work underneath the staffing firm for six months and then that employee is the employee of the company. Or they can buy your contract out early for a certain amount of fee. So it's a great way to get your foot in the door. So thank you for that question. Any other questions? Because <laughs> we've had some additional conversations. So, and I didn't know you mentioned incubator labs. Can you like, contract laboratories? Okay, yeah. Can yeah. you explain what that is? Well, so like in Austin, there are these lab spaces. Oh my goodness! Right. Austin is a mecca of new startup companies right now. Um, California real estate is 
extremely expensive. And companies, little startup companies, are moving to Austin, Texas by the groves to uh, take re up residence here. Now what a contract laboratory is, it's a company that has a large laboratory, such as a chemistry lab or a microbiology lab. Like Dr. Tanner's lab that was in the slideshow, he has a contract laboratory. And larger corporations such as um, like Coca-Cola, for example, may contract some of their lab work out instead of having to pay the personnel to run their own test and all the products and equipment needed to stock that laboratory, they just pay a company to do the test analysis for them. Does that answer your question? Basically that there's a lot of opportunities in biotech in here. There is a ton of opportunities in biotech. Well, biotech, pharmaceutical, research, you name it. It's running rampant in Texas right now. It's a great opportunity for you guys. Yes? You said you had an internship in TV like Tiger Eye. What did that change like? What did I be doing if I was Tiger Eye in TV? Well, you know, in my network that I have built up, I have this really great professor at Texas State University. And he sends me a student at least once a semester during graduation. And, you know, I have taken them out in the field with me, but I've also coached them on how to promote themselves in getting jobs. Um, I've helped coach them in product, uh, you know, knowledge on what products are used for. Because at BioLink, we sell hundreds of thousands of different products, ranging from gloves to cell culture materials to microbiology media. So it's a lot to learn, especially if you haven't worked with those types of products in the past. So I just try to help the students when I can, and Dr. McLean's great at sending some of those students to me. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Okay, well thank right. you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.